Thanks again for joining us today. Uh, we're really honored that you chose to spend some time with us and have us share our perspective on sustainable building practices and as we relate to the installation. And uh, we're really happy to have the audience here today. You know, we really invite questions as the presentation moves along as they come to you. On your screen on the right and the bottom, you'll see an opportunity or area where you can enter a question. Those will be collected and we'll review and discuss those at the end. And as I say, we value them highly. They're helpful to us, and they're always helpful to the other participants on the call. As you can see, this is Gary Caudill. I've been in the insulation business for over 40 years. Uh, began mostly on the, on the industrial side with a little bit of exposure to commercials, especially in the grease duct market and the automotive markets, and most recently with Johns Manville, primarily in the commercial market and sometime in the industrial market various roles after graduating from Georgia Tech with an aerospace engineering degree uh, in technical fields, uh, marketing, sales, business development, uh, leading several businesses, and now marketing and product management. Just a little introduction to Johns Manville for those of you who aren't familiar with us. Uh, we're approaching 160 years in business. We are a Berkshire Hathaway company, which we value highly as it gives us a great deal of independence and autonomy. And with the reputation that Berkshire has, we think it reinforces our strong commitment to integrity and in all that we do. You see our four core values listed here, people, passion, perform, and protect. For us, people are all about, it's all about relationships. <clears throat> relationships with the people that we have in our company and the relationships we have with you, our customer base. Whether you're a contractor, a distributor, a specifier, or a building owner, we highly value those relationships and work hard to maintain those. Uh, our passion is really being of service to all of you and going the extra mile in providing not only great products, but great service, technical support, and providing information and knowledge like we are in the webinar here today. The third area is perform. We want to be sure our products perform as we talk about, as we describe them to you, help you decide how they're used in the marketplace, and make sure they're used in a safe and wise manner and deliver energy savings, health and comfort in buildings, and provide our support towards sustainable building construction uh, issues. And then finally, protecting. You know, our first goal is to make sure all of our employees go home every day in the same condition they came to work and we strive for zero harm. But it's not only about our employees, it's also about the communities where we manufacture our products, where we work. It's the buildings that we help create, be they residential, commercial, or industrial facilities, and how our products perform in those environments. And knowing that our products are inherently sustainable in the fiberglass world as they're made from sand and they use very little energy to produce compared to that they save and the contribution towards reducing greenhouse gases. So that's a little overview of JM. We're very proud of our heritage. We're very proud of what our values are and we hope to represent those every day with you and your experience with JM so that we can become your supplier of choice. So a little bit about our agenda today, just an overview, overview of where sustainable building practice started and came from and where it is today, a little bit about what you uh, might want to know about the impact of insulation and respect to the current version of LEED, a uh, full discussion around some evolving things called environmental product decorations and health product decorations, and then really where is this movement going in the future? And who are the some players? Who are some of the new players that are evolving and influencing the trends and issues that we see coming down the pike? So, just a little history here. You know, energy conservation in this country has been out there for a long time. You know, since the beginning and the involvement of both ASHRAE 90.1 and different types of building codes. Uh, there were back the standards back in the 70s became the mechanical energy code and then finally evolving what we have today in that ECC and continues to evolve. New versions are currently under development coming out for 2015 and they will continue to evolve in the future. 
but as you see, most recently, a significant step forward in reduction of what we see in energy usage in commercial buildings. If they were all built to current standards, that these are assumptions, they're built to current standards, or the standards that are specified here. Interesting to know what we're seeing currently evolving is many people choosing to build, build beyond just code or the standards and attaining an even higher level of energy savings or health and comfort in the building. This is kind of a view of how the U.S. Green Building Council um, views the evolving world of sustainable building construction, which they have been certainly a leader in for many years since about 2000. Uh, certainly the, the dark blue is non-residential construction. Uh, the gray area is core and shell, two of the things that they've started on and driven very, very hard. You see the evolving area and the residential and the very dark blue at the top. This is USGBC's view of the world, how they view the impact of what they've done since 2000 on the building construction market. Uh, another view, and maybe one not as owned by the people presenting the information, is from Dodge, which used to be McGraw-Hill Construction, is now just called Dodge. Uh, this is how they predict and measured what they feel is the green building market, and green is a very broadly defined term there, uh, and the level of per percentage of construction that is out there. And you see they're predicting that in the coming years it will approach the 50% mark. Now this is not necessarily lead, this is everything they classify in the green building movement, which is pretty broad. That would be not just the materials to go to construct a commercial building, but also those things that go in in terms of the furniture and everything within the building. The takeaway here for me is that, you know, the influence and focus, uh, it's coming a more and more important part of the building construction market. Whether you look at from the perspective of U.S. Green Building Council or Dodge, who perhaps is a little more objective. But certainly one of the uh, things really driven, driving this trend has been the U.S. Green Building Council since 2000 and their development of what is called LEAD, you know, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And it's gone through a number of versions since that beginning back in 2000. And we currently are moved just now into LEAD version 4, which really started being developed before 2013 and due to a lot of feedback from the marketplace, they delayed the final implementation just until this year where projects now in the construction will need to be uh, under V4 and no longer under version 3. But the goals listed here you see for lead constructed buildings uh, are reduced waste, uh, conservation of energy and water, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, uh, improved working and living environments for building occupants and to lower the overall operating cost. Uh, it was very controversial uh, in the beginning, I think, for a lot of people as to what it would cost and the level of effort to go through a LEED registered or certified building. Uh, they've made significant improvements over the years. Uh, they have an online registration and monitoring and documentation system that has made it easier for people to participate in LEED. Uh, and they've taken a significant amount of feedback. I, there was an article in a couple of publications back about four or five years ago how a lot of the schools in the country that were built to various lead survived levels and how they weren't achieving the lower energy costs that they hoped to achieve by building to that level. Uh, I think that's been addressed to some extent and before as to how you get various points. So we'll kind of go through that as we move through this discussion. So of course we're focusing on insulation and areas within the LEED uh, program where you can achieve various points. Uh, one area is what's called M&R, Materials and Resources, and it begins to use things like life cycle assessment. Uh, there's other things that can be used like in environmental product declarations we mentioned earlier. 
uh, the sourcing of raw materials, what the material ingredients are, and it, it moved towards an area of replacing a single attribute evaluation uh, with LCA and optimization of the environment, habitat, and health endpoints to this three two-part disclosure system, disclosure system discussed above. So a significant change there in this area of LMNR materials and resources. Another area that we've moved into that is new is uh, low emitting materials. Been a lot of concern over the years about VOCs or volatile organic compounds and how we understand what are the sources of that. You know, the carpet industry made significant strides and changes over years, partially in response to LEED, partially in response to other feedback from the market. And so measuring the level of VOCs that are put into the environment is something that's of great importance to architects and building owners these days. Uh, LEED has moved in a direction of how those can be measured. They have some standards that we'll discuss later that they have, such as they had a rating many years that was a Green Guard for Children's in School. That's now been replaced by Green Guard Gold, but it measures at a very low level um, volatile organic compounds. And a second area uh, in an indoor environmental quality is not just the air we breathe, but is the acoustical performance we live in, the level of noise, especially important in schools. Uh, there's been a lot of government regulations about the noise levels necessary to support learning in the classroom. Those are, uh, those are in place. Interesting enough, we have seen, observed ourselves a trend back toward using fiberglass as a duct lining material to reduce noise levels in schools where 10 to 20 years ago there was a movement away from that. One of the reasons of that is we've done a good deal of education around the proven safety of fiberglass. In fact, we have a webinar for that that you would be able to attend, and we have online training around the health and safety of fiberglass that's available. But an IEQ and door environmental quality has been a big part of what has driven sustainable building construction. Just a uh, quick overview to lead certification opportunities. You know, you can, and today you can do a lead certified, uh, different levels of silver, gold, or platinum, and these are the points, excuse me, you need to achieve in order, to, you need to build into your building uh, system in order to achieve those. Uh, and on the left are the credit categories that are available. The ones that we will talk about today are energy and atmosphere, material and resources, and IEQ that we've just gone over. Those where insulation play the heaviest role, although there is some opportunity at times under innovation. So looking at LEED today and the energy and atmosphere area, here is how insulation can participate. This is the most impactful area and opportunity for any building to achieve points. As you see, if you go for optimization in 1 to 18 points, it is a single, one of the single largest categories out there, and insulation can play a significant role. It's not easy to achieve, uh, and it has to take a whole system-integrated approach. You know, the whole exterior wall system, you need to think about the windows, the, and there's a whole evolving trend in commercial construction around the building envelope and the types of construction that are used. It's been dramatically changing over the last five years, and the role of insulation and the types of insulation used there has dramatically changed. But also it impacts our mechanical systems, the insulation in the roof, and the lighting systems within the building. Uh, you see, under the previous version of LEED, uh, the base for ASHRAE 90.1 was the 2007 version. Under V4, it's moved to the 2010 version. And, you know, there's newer versions evolving out there, and it will be interesting to see at what point uh, they move forward with that. You see just the prerequisite to have a, a LEED registered or built to LEED standards building dated above. I won't go through those but there was some upgrade of that. And then the very uh, 
aggressive goals that have been set uh, to optimize energy and to get the higher points uh, with the maximum being a 50% improvement for new construction, which is not easy to achieve as we hear from both the architects and the mechanical engineers designing the systems that we're involved in with a lot of our products. One of the things we're hearing a lot from both the mechanical engineering community and from the contracting community that we work with is there's a trend towards building toward lead standards and maybe using all of the guidelines in each of these areas but not necessarily going through the lengthy documentation process that is required to achieve the actual higher levels of certification. That's a decision that each building owner must make. Looking at uh, materials and resources, M&R, frequently acronym used for it. Uh, a lot going on here. Uh, I'll try to make this clear, but you notice the points that are available within M&R for insulation. Only one point under environmental product declarations, only one point under sourcing of raw materials, and only one point under material ingredients. And to participate in those, your one or insulation would be one of the 20, greater than 20 products used. Uh, and you see the level of points you get for each level of type of uh, information that you're able to certify or obtain for a product. An LCA, a quarter point per product, of product, EPDs, a half a point, uh, a product specific EPD rather than an industry wide EPD, one point. And we see a lot of people because, you know, generating environmental product declarations, which we'll talk more detail in a moment, it takes a lot of uh, time, uh, usually a third party certification, and developing the information uh, from us as a building products manufacturer, from our raw material sourcing to how they're used, our yields, the energy, the embedded energy to manufacture, and then transportation to our customer is a lot of collection of data assessing that data, and then having the third party validate it. So it takes a significant amount. That's why you see a lot of people moving towards industry-wide environmental product declarations, uh, because it's a shared cost with an industry association. Currently, our, our industry association called NEMA is doing an in industry-wide environmental product declaration for mineral wool. Uh, on the other hand, in the fiberglass world, a lot of us are doing them individually. So it's kind of a choice by industry, but uh, and competitive factors may play into that as one manufacturer may choose to have an advantage over what he feels the rest of industry may have in the positioning of their product with the information that comes out of an EPD. Uh, sourcing of raw materials, again, 20, uh, 20 products uh, involved. Uh, Notice the baseline, greater than 25% recycled content, and the cost of the product, the total value of the products installed on the project. Uh, notice the definition of recycled content for post-consumer for the 25% level. That counts as a full point. And for pre-consumer, only a half point, you can use a combination. So for instance, if you wanted to get to the 25% level, you could have 12% post-consumer, then you would need to have 25% pre-consumer to get the half point for 12 and a half to get to the 25%. I think you need another half point in there, but you can do the math. Um, and one change in B4 is that uh, mechanical systems and HVAC systems were excluded from this in the past because they felt like the recycled content and the metal used in both piping and mechanical systems and HVAC systems was so predominant it would outweigh other materials. Now, given this methodology that they're using as the value of the products, it's more of a level playing field and mechanical products and uh, are now and HVAC products are now included. So that's a change in B4. And then the final area is material ingredients, one point. Again, the 20 products, but you can have up to five products from any one manufacturer and with a chemical inventory of 
down to the what we call the thousand part per million. You can do this either by each manufacturer declaring publicly all their ingredients. You can go through a third party or a self-declared health product declaration, or you can get cradle cradle certification through a third party. All of those take a tremendous amount of, again, collecting information, sharing it, and we'll talk more about this in a minute when we get to health product declarations. And then finally, the important area of indoor air quality, IEQ. You know, we've really had a lot of issues back 20 years ago, 30 years ago, around six building environments that do a focus on it. A lot of work has been done over the years to understand indoor environmental quality, IEQ and putting a lot of effort to really being aware of the materials going into the building. And architects are particularly driving this area of attention today. You know, we mentioned low emitting materials previously. Um, there's a lot of certifying agencies out there that are willing to measure the off-gassing of your products over time and at very, very small up to non-detect levels and then share those results and certify them. You know, USGBC, now owned by United Laboratories, UL, has Green Guard Gold certification as their highest standard. Uh, then they have a Green Guard formaldehyde free standard. Uh, those are thought to protect the occupants of the building very well. Many of our products are either formaldehyde free, certified to Green Guard, or Green Guard Gold. It's an area of attention that we've put a lot of effort into over the years back uh, in the early 2000s, I think 2002, we were the first fiberglass manufacturer in our bats and rolls to go for miles of the high free with a product and now the whole industry has moved in that direction. Then the other area, uh, as I mentioned now, emissions for uh, installation are now included. Uh, but everything in the building is important here. The paints, the coatings, the adhesives, the ceilings, the flooring, uh, the wood that's used in, in residential and in some in commercial, the acoustical panels used within the building, uh, the furniture itself, the carpeting, all those are thrown into what is the total level of uh, emissions within a building as they impact the building occupant. And then uh, equally important, we mentioned earlier, acoustic performance. Uh, one point, and here is how you achieve those uh, for HVAC systems and the levels that have to be achieved. Insulation, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, our duct liner products, and we do have a ductboard product that is sometimes used in commercial construction as well as residential, have very good acoustical performance uh, and are an area that can be used to achieve points within this category. Okay, let's take a quick look at what we've been talking about in terms of EPDs and HPDs. Uh, here's just an overview of the steps needed to create an environmental product declaration. Uh, one of the, uh, the PCR, the product category rules, which is what a PCR is there in the beginning, those are set by a third party. Uh, UL is currently upgrading those for mechanical systems. Uh, they haven't been changed in about five years. They're going through a reevaluation of those and including some products for mechanical and HVAC systems that were not included before. And that PCR rulemaking will probably take about six months. Once those are published, we then use those to gather information on raw material sourcing, how we manufacture our products, collect that data, we provide that to a third party, and they do an analysis and present the data in a format that's been developed for EPDs. We then can either self-certify to that information or we can pay additional monies and get third party certification from someone such as UL, and then we would have a formal EPD registration on UL environments. Uh, that's a process that we currently have, going, have almost completed for a number of our products. It's taken us uh, almost a year to complete the process with the third party certification. So here's UL's view of EPDs and uh, how they are, are uh, why they are generated. 
they advocate, of course, for third-party certification, which everybody agrees has some value, uh, added cost, added time. Uh, as I say, we are currently investing in them ourselves and what they hope to achieve by uh, having them in place. Uh, notice that uh, to get 200% of the value in the rating if the product sourced with a project site. That is quite frequently uh, difficult to achieve when you have an industry such as ours, which is very capital intensive with a few manufacturing plants located around the country. But for those that are close, it is an opportunity. So this is a very big, evolving area, as you'll hear later. Uh, but what the architectural and building owners and several companies, uh, such as Google and others, have really driven the need for this. And what the, uh, what the designing and, and occupant owners said, it's very hard for us to evaluate what's going to happen at the end of a construction process in our buildings when we don't know all of the raw material ingredients used by building manufacturers that go into that building. So what we want to see is more sharing of information. Well, what a, lot, what a lot of us as manufacturers said, you know, we're happy to do that. However, we have a lot of proprietary information. We have a lot of intellectual property that we've invested in. We have a lot of trade secrets that we want to disclose. So how can we accomplish the somewhat competing goals? And um, that's been evolving over time, and I'll show you how it's evolved to today. But there was something that was set up called the HPD Collaborative as an organization where manufacturers could go and go through a listing process that did not become public as to all the details. But then the HPD Collaborative would come back with an HPD that summarized the information and the details of exposure so that architects and building owners can make some assessment of what risk they would be taking with that product by using it. One thing that was missing from this process for us as a manufacturer, it did determine exposure to all the ingredients, but it did not able to have a system to evaluate, is there any risk associated with that exposure? So you could have a very low level of something in a product that could put uh, risk if the exposure duration and the amount was long enough. However, many of these minor materials that are naturally occurring in nature might be so low that even over the, if an occupant stayed in the building 100% of the time over their life, there is no real risk of health impact. And that has been missing from this dialogue and we as building manufacturers have been searching for a way to bring that in. And later I'll show you where that may be an opportunity. But this is some of the things that go through generating a health product declaration. Uh, I won't read this list. I'll give you a few minutes to capture it yourself. But at the end of the day, you know, it's for people who are designing buildings or occupying buildings that own them to really assess and understand what's going into the potential, potentially going into the environment. One of the things we have as a fiberglass manufacturer is inherently fiberglass is a glass. It can contain uh, an undesirable in a small quantity of some material, but it is encapsulated in that glass and is never going to either leach out or come out as a volatile organic compound or come out into the air that we breathe. Therefore, although it's present, there is zero risk on impact to one's health. And that's the point we're making here. You know, an HBD is an assessment of exposure, but it is not an assessment of the risk associated with the actual use of the product in a building. So where, where are we at as a manufacturer? Uh, as I mentioned, you see the products that, uh, that we manufacture that go into a building uh, in the mechanical area, in HVAC. We have been working for some time now. Those are pretty much complete and will be published shortly. 
HPDs, health product declarations, as we were just discussing, it's a little bit more of a challenge for us. Uh, we've had some success with uh, HPDs being self-declared by JM. We have published those for many of our products at the 100 part per million. We have done a lot of testing to go see what's contained in the glass that we manufacture and the binders at a very detailed level for a thousand part per million. And there's something new evolving called ASTM E60 committee that has an approach that we think will balance this risk assessment versus just exposure. And that's the path we are most probably going to pursue. And you'll see in a minute more details about ASTM E60. So um, this is a changing landscape of who's participating in this dialogue, and we are happy to do that. And here is some of the evolutions that are taken out. Certainly we have to give USGBC and LEED and now UL a lot of credit for getting us very far down the path. Uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier is one of the th things that did come out very specific in uh, D4 of LEED was uh, non-added urea formaldehyde for that insulation that goes in the walls or the ceilings of a school. Uh, the industry has moved away from formaldehyde in general. As I say, we were the first manufacturer to do so many years ago, and all manufacturers now have uh, non-formaldehyde containing uh, insulation baths. Uh, but uh, the collective group of architects, as I've said, really have drawn attention to this over the last several years because ultimately they're accountable and responsible for the design of the building. Uh, one or two firms started with some letters out there asking for more transparency in building products. And over the last couple of years, uh, maybe more than 36 firms now, uh, but 36 of the largest at one time had uh, letters out there either stating that they would either require health product declarations or give a preference to manufacturers of building products that had health product declarations. So they really stood up as uh, the leading designers of buildings and said, this is important to us and you as building manufacturers need to respond and we have been working to do that. Uh, so I think architects are probably uh, deserve a lot of credit for what they've done to really urge this transparency in building products. Uh, a new organization out there is something called the Living Building Challenge, probably the most uh, demanding certification program out there and probably the hardest for a building to achieve. Uh, there's been several buildings built over the last three or four years to that level. Uh, I will say those have been very expensive buildings. Uh, the Quartz project has kind of evolved over the years. Uh, I mentioned Google earlier. They've invested money in this area uh, to try to drive uh, the issue forward with uh, building construction. Uh, they partnered with somebody called the Healthy Building Network of Pharos. Uh, was an early thing funded by uh, Google that is now a part of the Quartz project. Uh, and then ThinkStep is a certification agency that has developed a lot of the standards, especially around EPDs and the process for getting uh, an assessment done. Uh, our industry association, North American Insulation Manufacturer Association, that is both fiberglass and mineral wool, is working with Quartz Project. Um, some of the early materials they had out there weren't completely on target and accurate. Uh, they've been very cooperative in taking feedback from the industry and updating their information, and it's an ongoing process for us. I mentioned earlier the uh, ASTM E60 committee. Uh, it's an alternative to HPDs. Uh, some of the architects were lobbying early that they didn't really want ASTM to step into this area because there was a system out there for issuing HPDs and they were very satisfied with that work. Uh, I think they participated on the ASTM evolution of this standard, and I think they're more on board now, but we'll leave it to them to decide and tell us if that is a, if the approach that's being evolved 
is acceptable to them or meets their needs. Uh, the standard has been out for several rounds of vote. It has been evolving. And what we think will be the final vote will be here. Uh, it got delayed from June. It's uh, actually coming up in the, in the month of September. And so we then should have something. And that is where the building products manufacturers have been able to achieve some input on risk assessment in combination with the exposure level. And then some other players out there, uh, green screens have been around a while. They play, they play into some of the above activities. Cradle to Cradle has been around a while. And there's a new one called the Well Building Challenge out there. So you know, this is a changing landscape. We've made a lot of progress, we think, over the last 10 years in, in evaluating materials that go into our buildings and improving them. And I think it'll change a lot over the next five years. And uh, there's a pretty good healthy dialogue now between all the stakeholders and trying to set both uh, balanced standards that really contribute to the protection and well-being of the building occupants and also offsetting that with not being arbitrary and limiting things where there is no risk of exposure, i.e., such as I said, contained within the glass structure of fiberglass, or the risk to one's health is non-existent just because there's a very small amount present. So uh, that's kind of covering the materials. We're going to move in a minute to questions. And so if you haven't had a chance to enter any questions, we would invite you again at this time. Uh, at, for those who have participated in the call today, you will, you will receive a certificate of completion. And if you're getting PDH credits from some organization, you can submit the certificate. And if you would like additional information from Johns Manville to support that, let us know. But uh, many of you have asked for this. We hope you find this helpful in uh, getting your own your personal development credits. So some other things coming up. Uh, we'll send you a link to our sustainability report. We publish it annually. So our most current report is available, just completed last month. Uh, it's on our website, if you care to look there. Uh, we have an upcoming webinars, uh, the one that I'm didn't mention is essential designing, installing insulation for chilled water systems. And then you will receive, as I mentioned, your certificate of completion. So uh, happy to have some questions now. Kim, you, what do we heard, who, who have we heard from? <laughs> All right, so Gary, our first question is, do things like ceiling tiles, carpet, acoustical panels, hardwood flooring, and building frames play into leads? Yes, uh, any of those can participate in those categories that we discussed. Uh, they could be one of the 20 products. And that in some cases there, uh, I would say carpeting and certainly ceiling tile can be some of the higher dollar content in the com commercial construction. Those may be the first categories that the person seeking registration or certification would look to and probably insulation lower on the list due to the total dollar volume involved. All right. The next question is, who's responsible for reporting, adhering to, and certifying lead credit? So that's a little bit of a complicated process today. It's usually the architect who maintains the same response, overall responsibility. Sometimes there will be a third party that manages that process for them. But everybody that participates in building construction has to provide information into the reporting system. So be it the insulation contractor, the mechanical contractor, the general contractor, the architect, the specifying engineer, everybody in that chain will be providing information to whoever that registering authority is. And uh, we try to put as much information on our product data sheets that are used for submittals to facilitate that process. We recently just launched a uh, mechanical engineering portal as a part of our website uh, for making it easier for engineers to go and find this information on our website in one point of entry. All right, next question is, are JM products lead certified? So products themselves aren't lead certified. You know, we looked at the categories where there's opportunity for insulation type products to earn points, but is the submittal of the product information and things such as the EPD or the HPD 
or the insulation value, or if it were a new product innovation, uh, to go to that particular category and get points. So LEED doesn't certify products. They provide opportunity for products to participate in their certification process and points be awarded in that category. And our final question is, what, are, uh, what is Green Guard Gold certification? So we touched on that briefly. Uh, you know, basically, they will measure, and you would go to uh, third-party lab. It could be USGBC or UL, or it could be another lab that is certified and recognized. You expose your products in a controlled environment for a period of time, and they measure the level and type of volatile organic compounds that come out. If you meet a certain threshold, and it changes with time, so I'm not going to quote the number because it may have changed since the last time I looked. At one point, it was 9 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, if you're below that level, you can get Green Guard Gold certification. If above that level, you would just get a Green Guard certification. And then if it's above a certain level, you wouldn't get any certification by Green Guard at all. There are parallel organizations out there that do certification and ratings that uh, are less well known but equally valid. All right, well that concludes our questions. Uh, just for the attendees, you'll be receiving a survey following the webinar. We'd appreciate it if you'd fill that out, take a little time and just let us know your feedback. Additionally, if you have any other questions that you were unable to ask today, uh, you can submit those via the survey and we'll respond to you directly via email. So please keep an eye on your inbox for your certificate of completion. We will send that to you via email uh, by Friday, September 2nd. Otherwise, thanks for attending and we hope you enjoy the rest of your week.